Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am so pleased to be your moderator today for our event entitled Redesigning Pub Public Health for Health Equity. My name is Elise Adams. I am the Stanford Medicine Innovation Professor and a professor in the departments of Epi and Population Health, as well as in health, uh, health Equity, or sorry, Health Policy. Um, I'm an Associate Director of the Stanford Cancer Institute and Stanford Impact Lab. At Stanford Medicine, we are committed to improving population health and promoting health equity through research, clinical care, education, and service. As evidenced by the COVID-19 pandemic, addressing persistent inequities in health will require greater coordination, collaboration, and responsiveness across multiple sectors. Our speakers today will provide their insights regarding what will be required to redesign a public health infrastructure that is more responsive, effective, coordinated, and equitable. In their remarks, they have been asked to address two questions. One, are there critical barriers or problems related to improving public health equity that are ripe for change and that could benefit from a transdisciplinary approach such as that we have here at Stanford? Two, what role do you think health institutions can, uh, health and research institutions can have in redesigning public health? We have invited two amazing leaders today to give their thoughts on these important questions and to spark a dialogue. The first is Ms. Rhonda McClinton Brown, who joined the Santa Clara County Public Health Department in 2019 as Healthy Communities Branch Director. In this role, she oversees nine programs that strive for chronic disease prevention and that foster healthy and safe communities for all county residents. Ms. McClinton Brown brings 26 years of experience as um, a leading uh, various public health and health community, community health initiatives focused on race and health equity. She served for 12 years as the executive director for the Office of Community Engagement within Stanford University School of Medicine. At Stanford, she worked closely with students, faculty, and community partners to develop meaningful academic community partnerships within the domains of medical education, clinical services, and community engaged research. Prior to her work at Stanford, Ms. McClinton Brown has dedicated over 18 years to working directly with community health centers, county operated health systems, and in other uh, critical departments in public health. Our second speaker is Dr. Sandro Galea. He is a Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. He has been named an epidemiology innovator by Time Magazine, a top voice in healthcare by LinkedIn, and has been listed by Thomas Reuters as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. A native of Malta, he has served as a field physician for Doctors Without Borders and has held academic and leadership positions at Columbia University, University of Michigan, and New York Academy of Medicine. He's also served as chair of the board of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. His writing and work are featured regularly in national global public media. And Dr. Dean Galea has published more than 950 scientific journal articles, 70 book chapters, and 19 books. His latest book, The Contagion, Contagion Next Time, was published on November 1st, so congratulations. Each of our speakers will have five minutes for remarks, followed by question and answer. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. I will be curating questions throughout the discussion, and we'll have them ready for our speakers at the end of their talks. I will now turn to Ms. Rhonda McClinton-Brown to begin her remarks. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me today. I just want to start the conversation off by grounding us in what the original mission of public health is and continues to be. Um, our mission is to protect and improve the health of our community through prevention of disease and injury, promotion of healthy lifestyles, creation of healthy environments, and advocacy for policy and systems change. Some of the benefits that we've had of traditional public health goes way back to John Snow and London and the cholera uh, water pump. Uh, and, um, you know, we have improved environments due to anti-tobacco policies to protect us from secondhand smoke. There's been advancements in injury prevention related to seat belts and bicycle helmets and car seats and fluoridating water uh, to reduce oral health and the invention of uh, vaccines and the reduction of chronic disease such as cardiovascular disease and strokes due to advancements in evidence-based practices around um, healthy lifestyle habits. Um, so the critical barriers, one of the questions for today to improving public health equity 
is that the mission of public health largely depends on factors that are really not always associated with health, like high quality education, income, wealth, social structures. And these factors in turn determine uh, resources and access to things such as safe and healthy housing, neighborhoods, open and green space, transportation, food security, affordable health care, and so on. Um, however, historical legacies, structures, and systems still exclude many groups, especially people of color, from the full and equitable access to these fundamental building blocks of health. And in order for us to reach health equity, meaningful progress will, need, will require us to work in new ways and with new partners while stre strengthening our foundational capacities. I wanted to spend just a couple minutes, many of you may have seen this framework before, but I wanna ground it because this is the framework in which we are um, center our work in, in public health. This is the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities um, Initiative, which was created by nine Bay Area public health departments and really is something that we utilize to ground ourselves um, in our work. Um, public health as a whole um, takes a proactive and preventive approach to focus on health of the entire populations while they're still healthy. On the right side of the frame is really uh, the medical model that really deals on um, interventions and impacts that impact individuals. Where we need to go and where we really are shifting our focus of our area and our areas of focus in order to reach health equity is the area within the circle. Um, and the area within the circle is really around treat, treating whole communities. This framework emphasizes that race and other social inequities should no longer be a predictor of one success and related health outcomes to achieve health equity. But every person has a full and equal opportunity to lead a healthy life. And targeted strategies and resources to focus improvements for those worse off or the most impacted will ultimately allow us to achieve a higher level of universal health for all. And so this framework assumes that there are certain living conditions, institutional inequities and social inequities that either protect us and give us a better chance of having um, being free of disease and injury, or there is factors that create more risk factors for us that predispose us from, um, to acquiring disease and experiencing injury. And so I wanna just share with you very quickly, and I'm not gonna go over this slide because we only have a few minutes, um, but I wanna just show you how that plays out in the work that we do in the County of Santa Clara Public Health Department. This is our roadmap for our chronic disease prevention uh, strategic plan that we have right now. Um, and this plan really highlights that the focus of our efforts are largely on addressing social determinants of health and healthy environments. And, and less so working in a clinical area, although we do still think that it is critically important to, to work on the bridge between clinical and community, um, because we wanna make sure that there is a nice transition of community resources for people as they transition in and out of clinical settings. Um, chronic disease prevention requires addressing social determinants of health and working at multiple levels. And this roadmap requires partnerships with community-based organizations and leaders who are experts in lived experiences and understand best what strategies are most effective within their community. These partners can also help us co-design interventions and mobilize communities for social action, which is really a critical component. Academic partners have expertise in urban planning, healthcare, environmental health, policy and public law, climate change, and different public health disciplines that can help us build knowledge, develop newly innovative evidence-based practices and inform systems change. And then other government systems and municipalities can be critical partners and help us actually change policy and transform our local environment and living working conditions and the economy to create better opportunities for people to thrive. So I wanna, in closing, I wanna share with you the five strategic priority areas that we are working on in Santa Clara County Public Health Department. And I believe these five domains also provide an opportunity for academic institutions who have subject matter expertise and skills needed to advance these areas. And I'll just give you some examples instead of reading through the slides specifically. So understanding disparities and disproportionate impact of health outcome 
through an epidemiological approach is critical for identifying where we focus our efforts, what resources we utilize to allocate in the most needed areas, and what strategies are most effective. Qualitative research is equally essential to understand better the root causes of unequal outcomes from those that are most impacted. Research can also help us shape policy that results in profound changes in, in um, population health. And some of those examples are things that we're working on currently. We're doing a public cost of gun violence study. We're doing a um, work as a result of a public impact of airborne lead exposure study. And we're also doing a study on the public perception related to the sale of tobacco products. Um, population health data is the center of everything that we do. And we saw how important this was during the COVID pandemic. We really, really needed uh, the support of academic partners to help us understand the situation and where we allocate our resources and where we focus our efforts. Pursuing partnerships with academic institution on technology to improve access to and integration of data systems would be a tremendous guide to help public health surveillance and research studies. The current, also the current um, public cost of gun violence study that we're working on has been particularly challenging due to the lack of historical data related to multiple elements needed for economic analysis across systems, healthcare, judicial, and other government and non-government systems. And then, and last, in terms of workforce development, partnering to build a cadre of community researchers with diverse lived experiences can help academic institutions answer questions most relevant to the populations most impacted by health disparities. And also, the value of racial concordance regarding healthcare access has been demonstrated through research. However, there are many more opportunities to learn about workforce and health outcomes through partnerships with academic institutions. So as um, I'll, I'll stop there, uh, there are many more opportunities to cultivate cross-sector partnerships and to build trust in communities most impacted by poor health outcomes. And I'm happy to answer any further questions or participate in the discussion in today's um, session. Thank you. Okay, should I go ahead? Very good. Yes, please. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Adams. Uh, thank you to um, 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 Stanford for inviting us. And uh, thank you to uh, Ms. McClinton Brown for um, it's really a privilege to be doing this uh, panel with you. And actually, thank you for excellent comments that really set up my comments uh, very, very nicely. So in, to answer the two, the two questions that were posed to us, and I'm going to be very brief because I'm really interested in the questions um, from the audience. Number one is, how do we address um, health equity? And I think to understand health equity, one needs to, as again, Ms. McLean Brown said all of this really, one needs to recognize that health inequity arises from resource inequity and the two are inseparable. That fundamentally inequity, which refers not just to inequality, but refers to unjust, unfair inequality due to underlying preventable conditions in health reflects underlying in inequity in assets and resources that promote health. By those assets and resources to promote health, we're talking about the conditions of neighborhoods, the air people breathe, the water people drink, the food people eat, uh, opportunities to, to play, uh, opportunities to exercise, fair wages, gender equity, lack of violence, and all those forces. Insofar as there is inequity in access to those resources, there is then inequity in health. And insofar as, for example, we have racial health disparities, which was a term that was used much more 20 years ago, it really reflects underlying inequity in access to resources across people in different racial ethnic groups. So when one understands that, one recognizes that you actually simply cannot deal with health inequity without dealing with underlying resource inequities. And that, of course, takes the issue of health inequity. To my mind, I think it clarifies it, but it also puts it in context of the large scale effort that needs to happen in order to truly deal with underlying health inequity. And I think Ms. McClinton Brown's illustration was perfect about that because you actually show it from the side of practice, how one actually tries to wrap one's brain around the full set of resources that one needs to tackle and how one needs to address uh, imbalances and inequities in those resources. So I think the, the answer to the first question is, how, does, how do we tackle that and how does that benefit an interdisciplinary approach? Well, you simply cannot tackle inequities in economics and physical assets and social assets without an interdisciplinary approach. By definition, that requires people from multiple sectors and from multiple disciplinary and intellectual traditions to tackle the root causes of health inequities. Now, let me then move to how do research institutions help? 
Well, I think the answer to the question rests on what do research institutions do to begin with? And I think research institutions do three things. I think number one is they generate scholarship. They do research and generate ideas. Number two is they teach their students and they transmit those ideas to the next generation. And number three is they translate those ideas and make sure that those ideas are available to a wider audience beyond the walls of the research institution. So when we're dealing with issues like health inequities, I think what research institutions can do mirrors those three. Number one, it is the responsibility of research institutions to generate the scholarship, generate the clarity of frameworks, generate the theories, generate the data that illustrate how resource inequities become health inequities. And that, when we get, we're in rooms like this, I think sometimes it almost becomes obvious that that's what should be done. It becomes obvious that uh, resource inequities map onto health inequities. But I keep trying to remind ourselves when we're in rooms like this, that outside of rooms like this, this is actually not so obvious. And that it requires to be a lot more work that needs to be done outside of rooms like this in order to make this point clear to the general population. So I think the first role is to generate the scholarship, the ideas, the theories, and the empiric data to illuminate these points. Number two, which I do think is one of the, the key role of any research institution, any, any school or university, is to prepare the next generation. I think getting the next generation trained up and to have to be equipped with the intellectual and practical tools to understand this and then to go out into the world and do something about it is perhaps the most important thing that any institution can do. And number three is translation. And translation, of course, it means taking knowledge and moving it out of the typical sort of four walls of any particular institution and pushing it out into the world. You know, when you do look at surveys that have been done re recently, when uh, people are asked what matters most for your health, most people continue to say that what matters most for their health is their doctor and their own health behaviors. In fact, the, the notion that housing, neighborhood, transportation, uh, air quality, climate change, that that matters for health is simply not penetrating beyond 10 to 20% of the population. So I think translation in the, uh, from perspective of a research institution becomes critically important. And let me just add one thing, because I think, um, I'm not sure it was exactly part of the chart, but if I may, I do think that um, research institutions have a key role in helping deal with um, pushing forward solutions to health inequity through cleaning up their own houses. And I actually think we have a real responsibility in any institution, but in, since the question was asked as research institution, to say, how is it that we can structure what we do better so that we can actually tackle these questions, questions of consequence, so we can tackle questions about health inequities so that we are actually equipped to do so. Now, a lot of that has, has, been, um, has manifested in recent years in the context of sort of diversity, in the context of representation within uh, research institutions. And th there is no question that representation and diversity really matters in research institutions. But I think in some respects, that's almost just the beginning. I think beyond that, there is a full agenda to incorporate ideas of the centrality of health inequity in any institution that actually cares about health and to make sure that there is a culture that encourages scholarship of consequence and that teaches students within an understanding that health does not exist divorced from the broader social and economic context within which it's generated and which teaches students that we have a responsibility to translate that knowledge and to make a difference, even if it takes us years and decades to do so. So I do think that beyond this traditional scholarship generating role, education role, and translation role, I do think that this is a moment that requires some real soul searching on the part of research institutions to figure out how they can work across discipline sector or sectors to address the resource inequities that underlie health inequities. And I will stop there. Thanks so much to both of you. Those were fantastic comments. And I can't believe you did that in less than five minutes, each of you. So thank you so much for that. Um, if I might uh, take the speakers or the, the moderator's prerogative and just sort of follow up on your last point, uh, Dr. Galea, where you were talking about um, cleaning up our own houses. And I think one of the aspects of that might be um, what is the impact of these research institutions on the surrounding neighborhoods and communities in which we live. And I'm wondering if either one of you wanted to speak to that a little bit in terms of, again, sort of with this idea of redesigning public health and how do we contribute, wh what's the significance of our impact in the communities in which we live and what does that mean for our ability then to lead in this space? I'm happy to start off since you, since you, you called on me. Um, um, I, I think we all have a responsibility to our immediate environment to, to our immediate uh, social environment physical environment 
ahead of a responsibility to our broader environment, ahead to a responsibility to our global environment. I think we have multiple levels of responsibility, but it doesn't seem to me as a stretch at all to say that uh, a particular research institution has a, an immediate responsibility to the neighborhood and community that affects. And I think by community that affects, I think it also involves the internal community, the, the staff, the faculty who are working within the, the students who are part of the research institution. Then we have the neighborhood environment. Then of course you have the municipality, the city, the state, the, um, the country, the world. You know, one of the things I forgot to mention in my comments was we have a global responsibility to address some of these issues of uh, health inequities and global resource inequities that lead to global health inequities. So I think these are all nested levels of responsibility. And I don't think that everybody within a research institution has to do everything for every level. Of I think that's, that's inconceivable. But the, the whole point of being part of a large institution is that together, the, the collection of people who are in the research institution are discharging the institution's responsibilities at multiple different levels. Any one person cannot do it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And Ms. McClinton Brown, did you have a response to that? Or no, I just wanted to add to that. I think one of the challenges that we have in public health is that um, you know, our mission is for the, the health of all people, um, maybe in a in a specific juris jurisdiction or in a specific community. Um, but when in fact in Santa Clara County, uh, where I work, um, you know, where we have the highest income disparities, um, probably in the nation almost, um, you know, that is difficult to do. And so I think the challenge becomes, you know, equality versus equity, right? And so, you know, we really can't allocate resources equally across all, the whole county because we have inequities that need to be addressed. And really being able to balance um, that need and that, that charge with the reality of really having a goal that is centered in health equity and being able to communicate that to higher resource areas this concept, um, which Dr. Galeo uh, very much highlighted that it is not obvious to everyone um, why the resources have to be allocated differently in order for us to achieve equity um, and, and not necessarily equally. So we need to invest very differently and very significantly in areas in order for us to really address the unmet needs and the, and the under resources that have happened for decades maybe hundreds of years for us to really work toward equity. So I would just add that. Thanks so much to both of you. We have a number of questions coming in and I would encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, in direct response to both of your comments, let me start with you, Ms. McClinton Brown. Someone's asking across the country, um, we see a lot of variability in social determinants throughout the, throughout the county and or the county, excuse me, the country. How do we unify the resource rich Northwest County with the underserved South and East? So where we sit now, how do we rectify these sort of resource inequities that you were just discussing across counties with respect to from a public health perspective? Yeah, I think I responded to this in the chat, but I'll, I'll repeat myself. I think COVID was a really good example of that, um, where we had very, very significantly uh, disproportionate impacts of COVID in, in specific geographic areas and with specific ethnic and racial groups. And what we did to address that is we significantly invested additional resources in the, in the, in, um, towards the communities and geographic areas that had the most impact with COVID. So we contracted significantly with community-based organizations and residents who have stood with us to really address our COVID activities. We hired community residents to be our, our team members uh, to, to do these efforts. And then we also, um, um, utilize our existing resources. So we stood at mass vax clinics in the under-resourced areas or the areas where we had the most impact. Um, and so I think it, it really takes a very intentional approach um, to, to, to really address um, those unmet needs. And it doesn't mean that you completely ignore. We all see there were also uh, opportunities in other areas, but there is a significant intentional uh, distribution of resources so that we can meet the needs of, of the community that was most impacted. Thank you so much and thank you to Jeffrey Delander for making for asking that question. The next question is for uh, Dean Galea. The question has to do with the haves and the have-nots. Specifically, what persuasive arguments can be used to move us 
in terms of that resistance among those who have the resources to thinking about those who do not have the same resources and sharing? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think we're living in a moment in time when if that answer is not apparent to all of us, we're not paying attention enough because the perfect illustration of why the haves and have nots are interlinked and, in ex and, and, their, and their needs are inextricable from one another is in time of a pandemic. Because what a pandemic has shown us is that if any one group has a greater burden of um, uh, disease, they actually expose other groups. So all of a sudden it became clear if it wasn't already for the general population that saying that, that well, if I'm a have and the person over here is a have not, well, I may care about the person because I'm charitable, but really their problem is not my problem. Well, all of a sudden it becomes clear that if actually there's a lot of uh, coronavirus over here, I'm at greater risk of coronavirus. So the moment of a pandemic has given us this terrible, wonderful illustration that the health of haves and have nots is inextricable. And that of course gets us to the larger agenda that we need to start thinking of health as a public good, the same way as we think of fire stations and park in the environment, that we recognize that our health is interconnected, intimately interconnected. Now, to do that, we do need to change the conversation on health, because for a long time in this country, for about 30, 40 years, we've had this narrative that each of us can buy our own health. Of course, that's a mistake. What each of us can buy is sick care. What we can buy is medicine when we're sick, but we cannot really buy our own health. Our health depends on the world around us, and it's a shared resource. So it does move us to needing to shift the conversation to health as a public good and think of health as a public good rests itself on a compassion for all of us. The saying our shared humanity should motivate us to want each of us to be as healthy as possible, both because it's the right thing to do, but also it's the smart thing to do to promote each, um, each of our own health. So it's a sort of slightly complicated answer, but at core, it is about highlighting our commonalities and our interconnections. And in a pandemic, surely that point should be abundantly clear. Thank you so much. Excellent response. Um, we have another question for both of you, and that is from Wendy Bernstein. And, and this person asks, can you talk a little bit about the particular challenges that our undocumented residents face and how um, to address them through public health intervention? Yeah, I, I can uh, say a little bit about that. Um, there's a couple of things around undocumented immigrants. One is, you know, um, the, you know the the importance of race and being able to call out race. The second is immigration status and being able to really talk openly and normalize the conversation about the difficulties that undocumented immigrant communities have um, in this country, and and really be open and honest um, about how we need to shift our the way we work um, in order to really meet the needs of undocumented communities and and be very explicit and intentional about that one of the things uh, and and one of the challenges that we have of course in public health is we're a government institution and you know we have a history as government of doing wrong and doing harm uh, to communities and so there is an issue of trust that is always there um, and it's really important to acknowledge and to call out that trust is a real a reality for, for very real reasons um, and to really own up to that. And so some of the things that we do um, is we partner. We partner with um, trusted organizations. We partner with community residents to be leaders in the implementation and the development of their own community-based interventions and programs and services. Um, we create spaces that are safe and responsive to what the community needs and then try to figure out how we could reach that community. And I wanna say that that seems really simple, but it is not very simple to do in a government setting. Um, it's very, very difficult to institute contracts sometimes with people who don't have a social security number. It's very, very difficult to contract with small grassroots organizations who may not have the infrastructure that the county has deemed appropriate to be a, a subcontractor or vendor. Um, um, we just recently tried to do a contract with a, with a community group that requested the contract and the negotiation process be done in Spanish. And that was very, very difficult for us to figure out to do. This is an example of how we have to do work differently in order to really achieve health equity. We have to change structural systems that are barriers in order to meet the needs of communities and populations. But those are the types of things I think that we wanna be doing more of 
um, to really significantly address the needs for undocumented communities here. Nicolaia, did you want to answer that one as well? Um, I actually thought that the answer was excellent and comprehensive. Um, the, the only thing I, I would add is, is that um, just taking a step back and thinking of undocumented um, immigrants within the broader framework that we started off by talking about, which is ultimately what are the what are the assets that undocumented immigrants do not have access to and how does that translate into them having poor health, right? So to go back to physical assets, social assets, um, um, the undocumented immigrants typically are living in worse infrastructure. They have fewer social networks, less access to health promoting resources. So that's the way to think about it because ultimately it is about what assets are we providing and what assets um, uh, do particular groups have access to. Undocumented immigrants obviously have access to far fewer assets simply by virtue of the fact of how we structure who we make assets available to. So I think one can see undocumented immigrants within as a as a special case within the broader agenda we're discussing here, which is a a resource and asset framework and the equity of resources and assets results in equity and health. Inequity in those resources and assets results in equity and health and limited access to resources and assets results in limited health for particular groups. Thanks to both of you, those are excellent comments. And I just wanted to underline Ms. McClinton Brown brought up these sort of structural issues we face with academia as well. Um, you know, sort of the bureaucracy, uh, that bureaucracies that we live in that we rely on or upon aren't necessarily used to working with community partners and so working together for strategies that can ease that process and facilitate partnership rather than create more and more barriers to partnership, I think is excellent. And I, and I love your addition, Dr. Galea. And I would also add too, that you always think about not just what we could be doing to better serve under undocumented peoples, but what are we missing out on by pushing people into the shadows and not allowing uh, the benefits of their knowledge and wisdom and, and um, and innovation and everything that they bring to the table out into the open and contributing to some of these solutions. And so partnership strikes me as incredibly important uh, for achieving that and getting together uh, so that we can jointly um, improve our situation. May, Thank may you so add, much. May I add something to the Please. Um, because I th the, the last thing you said reminded me of something which I wanted to say earlier, which is that we, I, I, I often can't help but feel like we as a society so undervalue the return on investment of actually creating health equity and making sure that all groups have the capacity to live healthy, productive lives. And when, when, when you have a conversation like this, I sometimes have um, you know, criticism that say, well, you're asking for paying attention to assets and resources for everybody, which is going to cost us a lot of money. Yes, but that cost is well offset by creating a longer, healthier, life trajectory for so many that then returns itself in terms of ROI to society manifold. Now, the literature on ROI is actually not as well developed as, as perhaps we'd like it to be, but we do know enough to know, for example, things like early childhood education. Investing in early childhood education returns five times um, in dollar for dollar as much as we invest in it. And uh, CDC has some of these in, the, in their high five initiative. So I think one needs to recognize that it is well worth the return on investment to bring, as you put it, Professor Adams, bring groups out of the shadows and actually making sure that they have the potential to flourish and to live full lives. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few more questions here, so I'm gonna to try to get to as many as I possibly can. Thank you so much for your wonderful answers. So the next question is from Helena Roy, and they ask, how do you think disparities in information and media consumption have impacted health choices for different groups during the pandemic? And I'm not sure who wants to take that one first. Can you just repeat it? My pleasure. How do you think disparities in information and media consumption have impacted health choices for different groups during the pandemic? I'm, ha I'm happy to speak about that uh, for, for here. Um, I, I think that media has uh, played a role in two different ways. I think there's a lot of misinformation uh, that, that um, came out from, from media um, that um, I think there's trust came into play also um, that some groups weren't sure that they could trust the media. Um, and um, I think that media has gotten a little better over time as the, as the pandemic has progressed 
in being a little bit more targeted, being a little bit more specific. There's been some um, focus on, on different um, issues that need to be addressed in media, and I think they've done a better job over time. I think that media is only one uh, outlet uh, for information about uh, during the pandemic. And I think there are many people who uh, were without uh, media access and so were, were without having those critical, critical messages that they needed to have. And so how we addressed that was a multitude of strategies from community-based town halls, um, really instituting a very significant promotores community health worker network who could help uh, be trained and spread the word. Um, we uh, created some resiliency hubs in different areas throughout the community, at parks, at community centers, um, um, at our offices, um, at our East San Jose office, where people could come and get information about it. We subcontracted with community-based organizations who stood up their own communication strategies. And we did a, a media campaign with uh, local leaders and community residents that were identified by the community as important um, respected uh, voices. And we filmed and interviewed them about their experiences, whether it be getting tested or perceptions that they had or their learnings through the pandemic, and then shared those broadly within their respective communities um, in a variety of different ways. Um, so I think it was a multi-pronged approach because media is just one you know, slice of the communication strategy related to understanding uh, what, what was happening during the pandemic. Let me add to that. Um, uh, Ms. Bicklet and Brown and I are very much aligned in how we think about these things. So, so we, 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 for the audience, we didn't actually plan to be aligned ahead of this talk. It just turns out that we, we are convergent evolution. Um, um, I actually agree with, with everything you said. Let me just add one thing, which I want to add specifically about social media, because it's a, sort of it's another part of the puzzle. And uh, I think one of the one of the um, issues that we've had in time of this pandemic is that the public square at the moment has been replaced by social media. And we're at this awkward moment of growth in social media, learning how to use social media. And, and I, I don't know, I'm, I, there's not a Luddite comment against social media. All it is, is recognizing that social media is not really the public square, right? Social media is a, is a forum that is driven by algorithms that elevate argument, emotion, disagreement, and conflict. And as a result, the public square has been taken over by conflict, emotion, argument in a time when we actually needed a really accessible forum for genuine airing of discussion and debate for disagreement that is not disagreeable to allow us to identify the best way forward. So I do think that we as a country have suffered from the fact that we are at this moment in the evolution of these social media tools that we do not quite know how to use them to have nuanced argument. I, I actually, I'm pretty confident that we'll sort of figure it out. Uh, you know, Ms. McLean Brown mentioned, made the comment that the media has got better over the course of the pandemic. And I agree with that completely actually. And, and I think a lot of things got better as we learned them. So I'm hopeful that by the time we really need to rely on the public square and social media plays a part of that again, X years in future, we'll have figured out. But certainly 2020, 2021, has been a messy, messy use of social media, replacing something which I think we've missed very much, which is the opportunity to have nuanced, full sentence, full paragraph discussions about very complicated issues. Thank you so much. And on the vein of social media, we have a question about politics um, from one of my colleagues, Dr. Lorraine Nelson. So Dr. Nelson has said a question about resources going forward for both of you is that both Biden and Newsom are planning to allocate major resources to public health departments um, in the near future, she's saying, uh, do some saying around 20, 200 million, excuse me, in 2022. So Ms. McClinton Brown, the question for you is, do you see that local health departments in California are going to benefit from this influx of, of funding and uh, to apply more resources to the vulnerable communities who need them? And specifically, what will you be able to do that you haven't been done, that hasn't been done before with these new resources? Um, yes, so we have received some resources and I just want to say one thing before I get to the community investment that we've done, because I think it's significant in terms of this conversation. 
Um, one of the areas that was really hard for us is the data and surveillance piece. So we have really um, invested um, significantly in ourselves um, to really uh, improve our ability to, um, to manage data evaluation, surveillance, um, because I think that's a really critical piece so that we know where to invest our resources best. Um, in addition to that, we have significantly um, allocated resources to the community uh, for ongoing COVID, for a couple things, for ongoing COVID response to develop um, resiliency hubs throughout the county in the most impacted neighborhoods and among uh, most impacted populations. And then three, to help us think about a uh, future workforce and recovery and what should have looked like if we had, if we were in the position now when COVID started. So we have contracted with, we have community uh, based organizations that are doing um, door to door work. They have set up resiliency hubs at different locations. Uh, physically throughout the county and virtually for, for some um, ethnic populations that are not so geographically focused. Um, we, are, um, we are able to invest in residents um, who are actually working day to day on doing COVID testing and helping us with vaccine and really the co continuity of, of care related to COVID. And then helping us think about, you know, what does a future workforce look like that is in complete partnership with public health so that when the next emergency comes about, maybe it's a pandemic, maybe it's a fire, maybe it's something else, um, how do we mobilize quickly um, in a local geographic area and how do we stand up? Um, it was hard for us all to stand up. It was hard for the healthcare system to stand up. It was hard for public health to stand up. It was hard for our community to stand up. And in some ways we were devastated at multiple levels, right, during this process. So really investing so that we really build this capacity so that when we move forward, we can do this collectively together. And that also included investing in community health centers because, um, you know, our healthcare system wasn't really set up to integrate COVID vaccines and COVID services into our primary care operations. And it's been slowly, you know, coming along that we have the infrastructure to do this. But eventually, COVID needs to be integrated into the operations of our everyday work and really investing in our safety net system so that they really have that ability to do that and that we're not continuously working in emergency response mode forever, but we've folded, folded COVID into our normal business so that we really are more resilient and recover and prepared for the next thing that comes along. Wonderful, thank you so much. Dr. Pelea, her question to you is, do you see that the Biden administration's plans to bolster public health will translate into applying resource different, differently in different vulnerable communities? And what's in terms of what's specifically planned for those communities, if you have um, knowledge of those specifics? Yeah, my, my answer to, to that question is always, I hope so, because there is a lot of uncertainty about what is going to emerge from um, the uh, Build Back Better plans. First of all, there's a lot of, there was a lot of sausage making that went from the initial um, proposed, uh, proposed bill to what was eventually passed. And uh, secondly, there's going to be a lot of uh, questions about implementation. We've seen in the past, for example, with the Public Health Prevention Fund, that uh, there was legislation was passed with a certain amount of spend that was anticipated, and then the resulting resultant um, spend being much less than what was actually put in legislation. And there's many reasons for that, but often it's because there is uh, um, uh, th there is heterogeneity in what is said can be done and what actually ends up happening on the ground. So I really don't know what will actually happen, but the idea behind a lot of the Build Back Better discussion is indeed to invest in a lot of the infrastructural resources we're talking about here. And if they're targeted correctly, they would go some ways towards dealing with some of the health inequities we're talking about. Now, of course, we are still in the pandemic. So it's a, it's a very messy time, right? Because we're still dealing with an acute problem, even as we're, we're talking about building for the medium term and the long term. So it's a really tricky time to navigate in terms of where resources are going to go and what impact they're going to have in the long term. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we're also getting a number of questions around data and technology, and both of you addressed both in your discuss your brief talks. And um, I'm going to try to bring together a few different questions on technology here. So there's a series of questions on sort of what's the hope 
for leveraging some of these newer technologies for data generation and surveillance, et cetera, for addressing some of the gaps in public health. There are questions about um, are we using the right, right, right metrics? Is race and ethnicity something we should abandon altogether? You know, what, how are we thinking about defining peoples and how to really sort of track going forward disparities as well as our progress in health inequities? And then we also have a really quite interesting question from an emergency room nurse about precision medicine specifically and how the general population might be assured or not about this activity that, it, that while it may be well-meaning, that we know that it also has its pitfalls and how do we communicate around issues related to um, precision medicine and promoting health equity as opposed to um, uh, contributing to and or uh, increasing health inequities going forward. And it was a lot packed into one question, but in terms of what you're thinking about technology and data, sort of where should we be focusing? What are you concerned about? What are you excited about? <laughs> well, I can I can try. Uh, that um, uh, that 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 question is about seven uh, doctoral theses rolled into one, um, uh, which is uh, which makes it a really good question, but a difficult one. Um, I I think that uh, data can only help. That's number one. Let me just start just sort of with a very simplification right up front. And I do think that we have been constrained in our imagination as to what constitutes data. And I think we've been constrained on that in multiple fronts. I think at one end, our the, the pop population health science community, to call it that, has been uncomfortable dealing with large, big data resources that are messy and chaotic. And on the other hand, I think we've been uncomfortable dealing with narratives and stories that actually make up qualitative data that complement the data in the middle that we're accustomed to. So I actually do think that we need a more expansive view of what we mean by data and use whatever data are necessary to tell the picture of the resource and assets inequities that result in health inequities. So that's point A. Point B, I think in doing so, we do need to have clarity about what we're trying to do in terms of how we're trying to get data to assess the social economic drivers of health and what that means in terms of accountability of those data, data ownership, where those data come from, the role of communities, the role of experts in those data. I'll put in the chat a report that I had the privilege of chairing a commission called the 3D Commission about data determinants and decision-making that we just concluded in uh, October of this year. And it was a global commission really trying to articulate some principles that could underlie how data can be called better collected um, to be kept in mind to, to uh, empiricize social determinants. So I'll put it in Genesis, if you're speaking. Um, then I think the, the third part is to this, now going back against my initial reductive simplification, I do think that there are times when there is clarity about what, what needs to be improved, even if we don't have data to illustrate um, what is the optimal way of improving it. And I think um, Ms. McClendon-Brown will comment about this, I'm sure, from the point of view of practice. And I think sometimes the population health science research community is a bit paralyzed by saying, well, we just don't have enough data about randomized studies that show that this works. Well, when you're in practice, you don't have that luxury and you often have to act even though the data may be messy and subpar. So in the same answer as I start off by saying, I think data can only help. I want to say that data in and of itself is not everything. And sometimes action needs to happen even in the absence of data. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, that was wonderful. I agree, I agree. Um, I think that you know sometimes uh, we don't see the whole picture uh, without without data, and sometimes with with data we don't see the whole picture. So so we need both. I, I really like uh, what you said about the narrative. We need the narrative as well. We try when possible to to. Um, to have qualitative data in addition to quantitative data because it's really important to be able to tell the story. And then I just will I'll give another, I said I wasn't gonna talk about COVID today, but COVID just keeps coming up. Um, I think, you know, during the pandemic here in Santa Clara County, for example, the African-African ancestry community is very small. We're only 2.5% of the population. And um, until we were able to really look at the data by, by ethnicity, you know, it, it was invisible. Uh, we, we end up being invisible sometimes um, in the data to tell the story. And so once we were able to tell the story, we could see that we were dying at a much disproportionately higher rate than other populations. Another example is the Asian and Pacific Islander 
uh, community um, that looks like they're 102 percent or 103 percent vaccinated. Um, but when you break it down by sub Asian subpopulations, you realize that there are disparities and there are differences um, in COVID um, um, cases and there's differences in COVID vaccination rates by subpopulations, which really helped us focus what our um, strategies are going to be for the API community and who we were going to partner with to really make sure that we were addressing those disparities. So it's really, really important. Um, but also um, the comment about race, I think that race is an important metric because um, a lot of our inequities really are rooted in, in very explicit and implicit um, biases and discrimination that was really based on race. And so by not calling out race, um, we're really not getting to the root uh, of the challenges. And we really want to normalize the conversation about race as we're addressing and as we're trying to figure out um, strategies that we move forward with with health equity. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, Thank, I mean, it was a very difficult question and you're able to, to cover much of it and it's greatly appreciated. One additional thing that you both brought up and I think we've all been talking about is social determinants of health and what's going on in communities and how it affects people's health. So we can't just sort of focus on healthcare. Yet at the same time, we're asking healthcare systems to step up and do more. So we have a question um, from one of our, our participants about um, how do you <laughs> as a healthcare system think about defining health equity um, and, and what to do about it. And another one talks about, you know, how do we really, what's our, what's our um, sphere of influence as it were, as a healthcare system for addressing these, these challenges, some of them access and being sort of beyond the control of the physician or the clinician, whomever is treating the patient and integrate some of these metrics um, on the community side into the healthcare system so that we can at least be a part of the, the larger story, right? So this challenge of we're often within a healthcare system, we want to do more, but we're, we're a little bit uh, concerned about what we can do when a lot of the challenges we're facing have to do with education and income and housing and security, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about what health systems specifically can do. Sure, you know, I think, I think there's so many opportunities with healthcare systems. Um, and I think and I think that part of it is workforce and and but 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 only part of it is workforce. I think there is a is another part of it around really really broadening uh, the focus on the patient experience and and really trying to to lift um, to to lift the voice of patients to help guide uh, systemic and changes that need to happen in the healthcare system. I, I realize it's hard because in healthcare system, you know, you're bound by, you know, rever revenue generating systems, you're bound by regulation, you're bound by, you know, health plans. You're, there's so many um, structural barriers that allow for flexibility at the greatest sense of delivery of healthcare. However, um, there are many opportunities for innovation in healthcare um, with partnership, I think, with the people that are most impacted um, by the delivery of healthcare. And really, really thinking through what do we have the flexibility to change and how do we change that so that our outcomes you know, are different. Um, you know, how even in the workforce, you know, by by shifting our workforce. Um, you know, what does that look like? Um, you know, can we have other types of health professionals that deliver a big part of the services that really better meet the needs of the community and allow the physician to focus on other things or the health professionals to focus on other things? I just think some innovation that is really engaged in, and involved with patients um, will, could really pave the way uh, to make some of those, those changes that would make a difference. So much. Galea, did you want to address that as well? Yeah, the I, I will just add one thing. I uh, I'm actually in uh, in agreement with that, including in particular, I just want to elevate and underline the point about the complexity of this because of the of the incentives within health systems as to how they operate. I suppose the only thing I want to add is that 
I, I often think that the actors within health systems, you know, the providers, the nurses, the doctors, the social workers, have a strong voice in shaping how the general public thinks about health. And I think it's critical that those who are in health systems use those voices to make it clear that the health system itself is only a very small part of the generation of health. And that is part of the education of the general public. And I cannot help but think that that education will lead to the shifting the conversation so that we ultimately get to a place where we recognize that health is not simply the product of doctors and medicines. And, and that has to come, the narrative has to come from within the health system. That's, that's the only addition I would make. Fantastic comments. Again, we're um, almost out of time here. We're not gonna get to all of these amazing comments uh, in the chat, but there's one additional one. And thank you so much for posting that Dr. Galea um, in the chat. There's one additional one that um, strikes me as really poignant. and. This is, I'm sort of putting two questions together here, but um, a couple of individuals were asking about, I think, sort of prioritization of sort of where do we go first, where do we go next, and sort of where, sort of where's the innovation here with respect to, pub, to public health. But specifically, someone has written about concerns about things like missed school days for children and their impact, the impact on them and their parents, their health, their future um, employment and also um, sort of employment more generally. And we've all seen the data about in, in income inequality is just getting larger and larger as we go forward. And some wonderful work by, done by the Federal Reserve Bank recently showing those big gaps and how they vary across different subgroups. And I'm sort of wondering in terms of the partners that we need to look to um, within the other sectors of government, for example, and, and, and sort of the community level sphere, uh, what are the partners, where should we start? <laughs> So we start with our educational partners, like we have to start somewhere. So you have some thoughts about, about where we should start in terms of thinking about uh, rebuilding and re-envisioning public health going forward. Well, I think in my comment where I said other municipalities and, um, you know, I wish there was just one, but it's all of the above. It's, you know, we need to be working with schools. We need to be working with businesses. Um, and, and, and the big, the big box businesses, but I also mean small uh, mom and pop businesses, small entrepreneurs, local grassroots uh, businesses. Um, you know, we need to be working with government. We need to be working with city officials and city programs. We need to be working with community-based organizations. I think that um, all of this, um, has exacerbated um, all of the unmet needs that we already had. And so thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we recover? How do we move forward? I think that it's a very multi-dimensional, multi-pronged approach, and there needs to be strategies all the way around, really, uh, for different pieces of the puzzle to help us put this back together. And it is overwhelming and daunting. Yes, it very much is. Um, but I don't know one one institution that hasn't been significantly impacted during this pandemic in a very, very significant way, including you know families and individuals. And so I think it just takes really thoughtful and intentional thinking about how we work together across systems, across communities, um, and think about you know what it is that we could be doing together um, to piece it back together. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer of where we start because it's like, everywhere and everyone. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Dr. Galea, would you like to close us out? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the everywhere and everyone. I actually think that uh, one of the biggest challenges that we faced during this pandemic has been the disunity and division there has been between, uh, between groups and the othering of, um, of uh, particular groups. And I actually think if you know there were one thing, if you can say magic wand, what's the one thing you would do? I actually think it would be uh, healing a lot of those divisions and actually um, uh, making it clear to all of us that is everything and everyone put together that ultimately will move us forward. So I actually, I think that's a perfect code though. Thank you. I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you both so much for your contributions and for your, uh, to the date and during the pandemic and I'm sure going forward and especially for joining us here today and sharing your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.